Um, my name is Daniel and I'm with Pluralsight and it's my pleasure to kind of uh, help moderate the event today um, and just kind of help things go smoothly. Um, and just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started with kind of the main uh, bulk of the content here with Jen. Um, number one, we are going to take your questions and Jen is excited to answer those. Um, so wherever you're watching this, um, you know, right now we're on Zoom, obviously, but we're also live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, um, and Twitch. Anyway, if you, and LinkedIn as well, if you have any questions, feel free to ask those questions wherever you're watching this uh, at any point. And we're going to be looking for those questions and collecting those. And then Jen is going to do a Q and A toward the end of the event today. Um, so just like I said, uh, as those questions come to mind, feel free to throw those out. Um, if you're joining us via Zoom today, we will be emailing you at uh, probably at the end of the day or tomorrow with a link to the recorded version of the webinar um, and also some, some resources and, and whatnot from today's event. So we always get that question, are you recording? Um, yes, we are. And so just keep an eye on your email inbox um, and we'll, we'll send you a link to the recording in just a day or two, like I said. Um, and, uh, with that, I think that's the bulk of kind of the housekeeping. I know everyone's excited to get to the main event. Um, and so I will turn the time over to Jen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jen Robison. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and share about end to end testing with React Native. So kind of what I plan to cover today are different types of testing, just to lay the foundation of what we're going to be reviewing I'll make sure we understand what options are available in React Native. And then I want to share with you a React Native template that um, my agency, EchoBind, has created, which really helps you get up to speed with a um, React Native project very quickly. Uh, we'll have some sample tests in there. We'll go through how to add new tests and kind of what the template offers. Then we'll go through some high level of integrating with CI services, and I'll share some of my learnings along my journey. So before we get started, just a little bit about who I am. Um, I started my career actually as an administrative professional at the ripe age of 18. And before I knew it, I was stepping um, you know, into HTML with WYSIWYG editors and then just continuing to build from there. So I was mainly self-taught degree after the fact. Um, I have three wonderful children and my amazing husband. So I'm an engineer. I'm a forever student. I've been known to be a volunteer firefighter. Uh, I've been an EMT for 20 years. And um, most of all, I spend a lot of time chauffeuring kids around to sports and all sorts of activities. So let's dive into the different types of testing. So Ken C. Dodds actually had a great image about testing in JavaScript. If we start at the base, this is really the foundation. This is where you have static tests. Typically your IDE will help you catch a lot of these types of errors like typos and type errors that you might have in your code. If we go to the next level, we have unit tests. These are isolated and verify that individual functions are doing what you expect them to do. This can be something as simple as a function that is taking in an address object and returning a string with a formatted value. So you're verifying that the function that you have is formatting as you expected and handles any errors. Next, moving up, we have integration tests. These are ensuring that several units are working together in harmony. And then finally at the top, what I'll call the crown jewel is end-to-end -end testing. Um, and this is really the most difficult part of automated testing, especially on mobile. Um, this is where you have an autonomous user clicking around your application to verify that everything is functioning as expected. This is where we're gonna focus this conversation. So these are kind of high level, the, the options that we have for end-to-end -end testing or EDE is the common abbreviation. So we have Jest, Appium, some native tests, Detox and Cavi, and we'll get into a bit about these now. So Jest was created by Facebook. It offers a pretty simple, simple integration with React Native. However, it's kind of like an incomplete puzzle. It's missing some of the key pieces. 
When it's integrated with React Native Testing Library, it can test your components, but it's not really intended to test the implementation de details and user interactions. So can we really consider it an option for end-to-end -end, where I mentioned that's really your autonomous user clicking through and getting the experience of the application? From my experience using Jest with Enzyme, it really had too many hurdles to overcome. It had shallow renders, which made it difficult in finding the elements on the page, and it really left a bad taste in my mouth. On the other hand, Jest is really awesome for unit testing, and I will show you how we have that integrated in our template. So here's an example of using Jest. You can see at the very bottom of this page, it's relying on a snapshot of your view in order to validate that what was returned after pressing a button is what you got back. But it's not actually clear in the code base what that snapshot actually is. If you were new to this code base, you probably wouldn't know or understand what this test is actually expected to, re to return at a glance. Next, we have Appium. This is a general test framework. It's intended to work with several platforms, can be set up for the language of your choice, like JavaScript, Java, Python, or others, but it can tend to be a bit flakier. Its element finding algorithms actually operate on the UI accessibility layer. What this means is if certain elements are marked as important for accessibility, it determines other items are not important and then Appium can't find them. So here's an example of using Appium. It's really um, like Selenium. It uses a web driver, which can be a little bit odd when we're talking about React Native in the mobile space. But you can see up here at the top um, where we have a web driver being imported and we have you know, default interval timeouts and we have to do a lot of awaiting and sleeps. Um, and then you can see at the bottom where it's using the element by accessibility ID to try and find items. Now we'll get into native tests. This requires knowledge in native languages such as Swift and Objective-C for iOS or Kotlin and Java for Android. One of the appeals of React Native is that you do not have to be a native developer in order to release a cross-platform application. In addition, you would be writing your tests to test both iOS and Android in the native language for both if you were testing both platforms. I'm not a native developer, so I took this example from a Git repository for a React Native project. And I don't know about you, but it's not actually super clear to me because I'm not a native developer. These are languages that aren't as familiar to me. And here's just a little bit more of that same code. So now Detox. Detox was actually developed especially to target cross-platform mobile application development. This is JavaScript or TypeScript if you prefer. It has the ability to monitor asynchronous activity. It allows you to debug and test your application with varying levels of permissions and more. If you can't tell, I'm a little bit biased about this testing framework and I won't lie, it's far from perfect. It has its own set of problems and I will kind of go through that as we're going through this. Last but not least, we have Cavi. This is a framework that I just actually recently learned about. It claims to have you testing within five minutes. It's also cro cross-platform and it boasts first-class TypeScript support, which really excited me. Claims to have good integration with CI services as well. But unlike Detox, Cavi is purely JavaScript based and therefore it doesn't tie into the native dependencies with bridging. This means it has some limitations. It can't interact with native elements like the camera, permission dialogs, alerts, um, file pickers, and things like that. So in my case, it, it leaves it a little bit difficult in order to test the applications that I'm using in a production environment. So now that we cover the different types of testing and what the options are for end-to-end -end testing with React Native, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper. So the main focus is covering detox. Um, I will get into a little bit of Cavi at the end because I do see some great potential there for um, you know, applications that aren't touching a lot of the native dependencies. Um, so let's jump in.
we're going to get into a sample application using the template. So I'll let you know, I am going to do some live coding. And for all the devs out there, I think you all know that can be a little bit nerve wracking and things don't always go as we plan, but we're going to jump in. So at EchoBind, we've developed a uh, React Native template. It's a really a quick start and it has Detox set up for you. It includes Jest integrations for unit testing, Detox for the end-to-end -end testing. It has some sample components, screens, gives some examples of routing, and it has convenient scripts tied in. So we're just going to go ahead and jump in. This is where the live coding is going to start. I'm going to init a new project from this template, which is hosted up on npm.js, and then we're going to run it setup. So over here, I already have that command typed out. Um, this will take a moment to run. So bear with me. Right now, this is just pulling down the template from um, NPM. And it will then do the installation. So just a reminder while this is uh, doing its thing, if you guys have questions along the way, don't forget to submit those so we can address those at the end. All right, so we get our welcome to React Native. It's processing our template and installing our dependencies. Bump up the bond a little bit here. Some of the longest things uh, when doing live demos are like, how long is this going to take? Um, and for those that are React Native developers already, you can um, respect the fact that Xcode builds for iOS are lengthier. So while this is actually doing its installation, I'm going to hop over to a project I've already initialized. Um, oh, actually, you can see it's now installing the CocoaPods dependencies, which um, is sort of the, the native piece these days. Um, and also talk to you about um, something I just want to make sure everyone is aware of. This template currently is on React Native 622 because I found that there was an issue with detox um, when we tried to bump it to 6.3, which is the latest. Um, and something we have in the template as well is using a library called React Native Rename. Um, or that's not in the template, sorry. It's in the setup portion of it that I'm going to go through in just a moment. Um, and we found that there's a bug at 6.2 as well that's having problems with the rename. So these are things that we are aware of and we are working on. I just wanted to make sure I didn't sweep it under the rug and, and not call it out. I'm going to go ahead and go into my, um, my project folder, which I called my webinar. And I'm just going to run a, a node setup script that is included with the template. So this is using Solidarity to make sure I have the dependencies I need for Android and iOS that CocoaPods and Fastlane are installed, that I have the Simutils for Detox, that I have Xcode and Yarn. These are just some of the things that the project is going to rely on. And it will let you know if you need to install them from another location. So after that, it's going to go through the rename portion, which I was just mentioning the, um, the bug with. So I'm going to leave my project name as my webinar. I could change this if I wanted right here. Um, the, the true bug that I'm aware of right now is in the bundle identifier. If we use, um, you know, com dot and then name anything, the, the dot is creating a, a bug at this point. So I'm going to leave it as my webinar for now. I'm going to say, yes, I want to continue. Um, we have a convenient script in here, which will allow you to initialize your project in a Git repo. But for sake of time today, I'm going to skip that. So this is going to um, set up some basic app icons for Fastlane or using Fastlane. Make sure it updates the, the project display name and bundle identifier if I had given it a different name. 
It'll make sure that my CocoaPod dependencies are installed and linked. I don't have to um, change directories into iOS and do a pod install. Sets up my splash screens and bam, I have my project. So I, at this point, can run yarn test, which will um, run the sample just test I have in place, which is a simple trim text function. And um, we'll go ahead and open this in Visual Studio Code so we can kind of like walk through and see what we have in here. So in our package, you can see some of the convenient scripts we have. Um, our yarn start um, script will help you make sure that when you're running the bundler, it's resetting the cache if you need to. Um, we have our test scripts. We have a linter setup. We have some um, high gen templating component screen util type um, functions in here, which we will use the end to end one. So we'll see that here in a minute. Um, we have our iOS function uh, where we can specify what simulator we want it to run by default if it's not the React Native um, default. And then we have our setups for detox, which get into the end-to-end -end testing for both iOS and debug and release, and then Android for debug and release. You can see we do have some um, dependencies listed in here that help with styling and um, the splash screen and vector icons. So there again is just some basic things happening in there. We'll go ahead and um, now start um, the build for iOS and get it running on the simulator. So as I mentioned before, you know Xcode does take a moment to um, compile all the dependencies. The nice thing is that once you do it the first time, it does get cached. So it gets faster with each build. It will take a moment here. Let it run through all of its dependencies. While that's doing that, I'll kind of come back to the slides here for a moment. Um, so we've done the initialize of the pro the initialization of the project. We ran the setup. Um, we did go ahead and run our unit tests. After we do this first build, we'll show you the the integration tests that get included by default. Um, and I'll hop over to um, a project that I already had built so that it goes a little bit faster. But I did want to show you, you know, the ease in which it can compile. The longest it takes is really just to let Xcode do its job. So I'm going to hop over here to another project, um, which I've already compiled. And then we will. Oops. So this is the bundler getting running, getting up and running. Um, so you'll see here in a moment, it should be installing the my webinar app that we just created. And there we go. So you can see it's really simple. Um, we have an intro screen here, has a login button. This has um, a component for a login screen, which has some basic functionality that you know might be common to a lot of applications. Um, we have some validation checking and things like that in here. I can you know do some typing. Um, if I click forgot password right now, it's just saying, hey, haven't implemented the screen yet. Um, and if I click login, it'll navigate me back to the intro screen. So that's really like what's including included by default. There are a couple other screens in there with tab navigation that um, if I were authenticated, you would be able to see. I don't wanna get too far into the weeds with that. So we'll, uh, we'll come back over to the testing portion, but there is actually some really good bits in here that help you get started with React navigation and everything.
Um, so now we're going to jump over to this project. I'm going to kill the bundler here so that I can start the bundler on this one. And I'm going to use my convenient script for end-to-end -end iOS debug. And this is just a copy of this application. It was just already cached, so it should run a little bit faster. So we should see at this point, um, it's going to pop up on the iPhone 11 Pro simulator. While that's doing its build, I'll kind of touch base back again with what our plan is to touch on next. Um, so after we see that it builds and it's doing the basic test that's included, which is um, basically validating that the intro screen actually exists, um, if we look in that project and we look at the intro spec, we have a very simple test here that makes sure it reloads React Native before it runs every test. So it means I have a known um, state in which my application is starting. It's going to expect that it has an intro screen text um, element. It's looking by identifier and then it, that that is visible. Then it's going to validate that same element has text that says, welcome to the intro screen, which if you remember when we were looking at the application, that's what is up here. Um, so the, um, the test ran and it closed my simulator. This is a exciting part about working in React Native, which is not technically 1.0. Uh, things change. Um, out from under us sometimes. And I noticed last night that it suddenly, when you run the test, instead of leaving the simulator open, it's actually closing the simulator, um, which isn't a bad thing, especially on a CI service, right? You're not having to then manage that portion of it. But you can see it did the build, it succeeded, it then started the detox portion of it, and it passed our test for intro screen spec, should have the intro screen. So now we're gonna go ahead and create our, our next test, so we're gonna use our convenient script for yarn, generate end to end, and then I'm gonna give it a name, login screen. So we're gonna validate that our login screen has some elements that we expect. Right, we wanna navigate from intro to login. We wanna verify it has the email and password input fields. We wanna type into both of those fields, tap the login button, and verify that it navigates back to the expected screen. So we're gonna build upon this as um, we go through. And um, coming back to our terminal, you can see it now added a new file, login screen spec. It is a TypeScript file. I'm gonna go ahead and open up that. And this just gives me a shell. It does my imports for me. It creates my describe block, which is for login screen. By default, it gives me a before each. This could be a before all, um, but it, th in this case, I want it to reload before each test. And then it gives me um, a start for how do I want my first test to run? So I'm gonna go ahead and um, copy the code over here, which basically is going to make sure that our login screen is visible. Oops, I just want to do it in the describe. Um, so it's gonna expect that the login screen is visible, that the email input is visible, again, my password, forgot password link, and the login button. This is just making sure that all the elements are there. So we'll go ahead and come back over here and we'll run the iOS debug again, which as I mentioned, once the, the build is cached, it goes much faster. You won't see, um, you can see it's loading up the simulator right now for me again. It should open the app. So again, it's gonna refresh the screen um, or reload the React Native application in between each one. And I expect this to fail because it doesn't have anything to tell it to go to the login screen first. So it just did the intro screen test. It's now starting the login screen. And it's gonna be stuck on the intro screen and it's gonna say, I don't have these elements on the, on the page I'm on. So we want to make sure that it first goes to the login screen. So we're gonna add to our code in our before each, 
For all of our elements, we know if we're reloading the application, we're on the intro screen. So I'm gonna tap the login button, which will put me on the login screen and then test my elements. We'll run our tests again. And this is that good test cycle, right? Of um, failing test, what I expect, minimal amount of code I need to write in order to then make my test pass again. So we'll be able to see it navigated and it passed. It got all of the expected elements. So now we have a full test suite that, that passed. Um, I have noticed some interesting nuances with detox that the, um, the order in which the tests run can be somewhat random, not always uh, executing in the order you expect, which is why those before each or before all statements can be super important. So all of our tests pass, we're green, and we'll get a little bit more complex. We're gonna, um, we want to type in to our fields now. So uh, we are going to navigate um, to our, okay, sorry, jump back over to the slide so we can all be on the same page. So this was tapping on the um, login button. And then this was our first test for all of our elements to be visible. And now we're going to click on the login um, button, which will navigate back to the intro screen after we've clicked on that. So let's go ahead and take this test. We'll take it over to Visual Studio Code and we'll add it to our describe block and we'll execute our tests again. And if you don't want it to build every time, Detox actually has some additional commands. Um, right? So like I said, we have the convenience script set up in the package, which it, uh, is doing the Detox build for the configuration and then doing Detox test. There are certain changes that you make that are only JavaScript based, which don't require you to actually rebuild again. Um, so it can be quicker to actually just run the detox test function at certain points in your life cycle. So I don't know if you caught at the end, by the time I flip back to the simulator, it was actually typing into those fields for me. I even get the little key click sounds in my ear um, as I am listening. There are other functions that you can use like replace text instead of type text. Um, in our case, in our spec, we were using uh, sorry, the Zoom link is oops, in my face. Um, back here on our spec, you can see we were typing text. We could have replaced text. There's all there's pinch to zoom. There's all sorts of um, identifiers that you can use. So hopping back over here, we've now um, validated we can type into our fields, we've tapped our login button, and then it navigated back to our intro screen as we expected. So this would be a great opportunity to say like, if I typed in the wrong password, it displays the error message I expect. Um, so as I was mentioning, there are these convenience scripts. That's what I was using. Um, you can also use um, the detox build or detox test. If you don't have the detox CLI installed, you can always use NPX, which is pretty awesome these days. <clears throat> Here's a link um, to the um, detox documentation. It has really great information about the life cycle, the matchers, um, using wait for, which can be really useful in elements that may take a little bit longer. Maybe you're waiting for an API to respond. Um, and so it, you, you know, especially in a CI server, if the resources aren't high enough, it might take a little bit longer. So you might need to put some wait fors in there. Um, but there's some actually really great documentation on their site. So I covered a lot about iOS, right? You saw me using the iOS simulators and all of that. But in full transparency, it's a really a little bit disappointing. Um, as I said, React Native is not technically a 1.0 release, although there are lots of production apps, including ones that we have in the App Store that are using it. Um, it's been a bit of a roller coaster where Detox is working for Android, it's not working for Android, it's building, it's not building. Um, 
as I was like finalizing my presentation for this webinar, I found that although Android had been working just recently, it was no longer working again. <laughs> um, and it appears to be because of the Gradle. So it's something we continue to work on. Um, this is something that we've integrated into our template. And as we, you know, as time allows, we continue to publish updates. Um, it's really important that we continue to just push this further, make sure people know what's going on. So let's get into continuous integration. We've seen how Detox can integrate into our React Native application. You've seen the template that can get you going really quickly. We're only 30 minutes into this webinar and we have uh, you know, a pretty simple, like actually beyond a hello world, um, you know, React Native application that would build in both iOS and Android without too much uh, effort. And we already have some tests running in there, which is really awesome. Um, so here's our life cycle of, you know, kind of really, you know, we, we code, we build, we test, we release, we deploy, and we just continue on and on and on. Um, and continuous integration services really help us with that. This is something that if it was set up on this specific template, you know, running on our CI server on a nightly build, I would have known sooner that Android wasn't building anymore. So we're gonna get into just two CI services and really more focused on Circle CI. Circle CI is not specialized for any specific products, whereas Bitrise targets specifically mobile apps. Um, there's some really great resources I wanna call out that I recently learned about through um, somebody contacting me on Twitter, Josh Justice shared with me um, that he's got some really great information uh, around integrating with GitHub Actions and Travis CI, and that's at reactnativetesting.io. So there's some really good documentation there that he's providing for free. Um, so as I was talking about the different CI services, one thing I wanna cover is one of the things that we use in our template is Fastlane. Um, this helps bridge the gap between different services. The more we can have in Fastlane and, and utilize Fastlane setup, it's tool agnostic, right? You have a Fastlane YAML configuration file and it can be run from multiple CI services like Circle, like Bitrise and other platforms as well. Part of our template um, and, and documentation on GitHub for our template talks about kind of using our high gen generator that will get you started with a Circle CI configuration. Um, we are actually working on making some changes to this. We are using, uh, we're, we're getting ready to deploy a whole uh, CLI actually around the React Native release process and helping you initialize projects, getting them up on the Apple App Store, you know, creating the push certs and all of that. Um, so I call this out, I won't get into it too deep. There is some great documentation on our site but it helps power the CI um, setup for us. So Bitrise has some really great information on how you can add an application really quickly and configure it using your fast lane um, and what, what lane you want to use. Unfortunately, the last I checked um, using detox with Bitrise, it was failing for me. And so I focused heavily on Circle CI because that's what we use in our day to day. So software development is a journey. <laughs> As I was talking about, you know, the roller coaster and everything that I've been through, there has been so many bumps along the road. I've been doing React Native, you know, for the last few years and the, the ecosystem is, is growing rapidly, but with that also comes, you know, the growing pains. So things continue to evolve, um, you know, and it, it's really just a journey. We just continue to iterate and we'll keep sharing our learnings. And um, that's what I take as a win is being able to share like our successes. And um, even when we don't get a success, there's still learnings that we can have from that. So now we're gonna get into how did I get Detox running on Circle CI? So in order for me to get Detox running on Circle CI, I actually uh, had to take the React Native Community Orb, which if you're not familiar with Circle CI, um, they have things called orbs, which are essentially templates that you can use to really quickly 
have specific types of builds running on their system without having to do too much. Um, I took the React Native community one because I thought, hey, they have one that includes detox. This is awesome. And yet I couldn't get it to run specifically. So I decided to dig in a little bit further. CircleCI uh, has a CLI where you can um, process an org that you use with the configurations you've set up. And it basically um, expands it into all of the specific steps that it's running. And then you can start to play around with how to make it work. So one of the first few things I did was remove yarn flow. It's not a part of our template, so it wasn't something I needed. I, I needed to update the, the machine executor that the iOS builds were running um, to Mac OS 11.3. One, I removed a brew install, which was referencing an old version of Node, which I was really surprised at how old that was. And then I updated which iPhone simulator I wanted things to run on because I have a very specific configuration of my package um, for my project. So it needs to match that. Uh, at the end or after we go through the iPhone ones there, I'll show you kind of like the special configurations I had to do for Android as well. And I did have that running recently um, and now it's failing again. So here you can see at the top where I changed the Xcode version. I think it was at 11.1 and so I bumped that up and then I fiddled with the, the homebrew commands and the setup. I removed that brew install of node 8 and then I changed which um, iPhone simulator I wanted it to run down there at the bottom. So as you go through this, this is the specific Circle CI configuration. This is not in um, Fastlane. We prefer to do as much as we can in Fastlane, as I was saying, but I wanted to get in like the specific Circle CI portion of it. This is just the rest of it. At the very bottom, you can see after it does the iOS build and it caches that for you, it's using detox test for my configuration of iOS simulator release. It's running at log level worn and it's running headless. So it doesn't actually have to open up um, the simulator and run everything. It is doing those steps for you. Now here's the Android version, which gets a little bit more complicated. The iOS version of my configuration I had it um, all in one step. So on Circle CI, it would do uh, a build and then it would test all in one step. For Android, we have to do it a little bit differently. The Android builds run best and most cost effectively in the Docker containers using um, you know, Linux and what have you. But that doesn't allow you to run the emulators. So this first configuration I have here is the steps that I have to do in order to build my Android app first. It has a bunch around like, what are my Java options? Because otherwise you might get heap errors and all sorts of things. So um, I'm happy to share this um, configuration information with y'all um, after the fact. So here's the second step. So now this is Android test. You'll notice I'm running my Android test on a Mac OS uh, machine. Again, I'm using the 11.3.1, but this actually allows us to install the emulators for Android and um, actually execute the test successfully. So it has some very similar steps here where it's making sure we have all of the tools and the, the files and the configurations needed in order for detox to run, because remember it's like starting a new machine every time. So I have to install the SDKs for Android. I have to install the actual um, emulator I want it to run. At the very bottom of this screen, you can see create Android emulator is one of the steps. And I'm actually creating an emulator where I'm calling it test AVD. Now that name right there is super important because it needs to match what is in your um, configuration in your package. Because when you call um, detox test for that specific Android configuration, it is set in there of what um, emulator name it is looking for. So super important that those match. 
So here you can finally see the like the final execution of detox test at the very bottom. Again, that looks really similar to the iOS version. It's running with log level worn it's, and it's running headless. Again, this is running on the Mac OS machine. I share all of this to assure you I have seen with my own two eyes that it can work on CI. Um, yet, as I was stating, it's not currently working with the, the Gradle versions for Android. So it took a lot of failures to finally achieve success. So you can see I was playing around with this configuration for 43 times before I finally got the magic recipe to get success. And then I was like, let me iterate. And I, it failed again. And so I was like, all right, I'm gonna revert this. And that is you know, something that we do in our software development life cycle. We just continue to try and iterate, refactor, and you know, that's, that's how it's supposed to be done. So here's my bonus, and I love their logo. I just say that. Um, this is Cavi. So like I mentioned earlier, I just recently learned about this testing framework. It's been around since like 2017. So before I really got heavy into React Native, However, I'd never heard of it until recently. It's not uh, super, um, you know, when you search for end-to-end -end testing in, in React Native, it just doesn't come up. I'm pretty impressed with how easy it was to set up. Like I said, their claim to fame was it could have you testing in five minutes. And honestly, that was true. The biggest um, time sink for me was in setting up the, the CLI that I needed in order to have on my system. So it was the install time. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview and share with you again some of the limitations. Like I said, it doesn't, if you don't have to worry about things like alerts, a camera, location permissions, notifications, I mean, a lot of those things honestly are things that we use in a lot of applications these days. So that could prevent you from utilizing this, but I did want to share with you how easy it was. So to get started with Cavi, you install their CLI, you add it as a dev dependency, you add the type definitions if you're using TypeScript, which again, I love TypeScript. <laughs> you run this simple cavi init, and that's really it. You add in these test hooks, which if you're familiar with um, React or React Native, hooks are kind of that, that new um, way to tie into the life cycle. So you, you can use the use cavi hook and generate your references. So here is um, on my intro screen, you can see the differences. So on using Cavi, I'm using the ref and I'm generating the test hook calling it intro test screen. With the line below that, the test ID of intro screen, that is how I can access my elements by ID for detox. So it's really, you could have both running and you could run maybe some super simple tests with Cavi at a lower overhead um, and on machines, you know, running Docker containers and all of that. So it would be something worth looking into further. Running the test, it was a super simple Cavi run iOS. And you can see down at the bottom, I had a test that took a fraction of a second 0.114 seconds to run a test. Yes, it was a super simple test. But to be honest, that same test to run in detox, not even including the time it took to spin up the test, took eight seconds just for it to actually execute the test. So that is a huge time savings. I want to thank you for um, going through this journey with me. Um, this was, you know, really about everything I've learned and I'm happy to take any questions right now. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all this so far. It's been really fascinating. Um, we definitely have a few questions that I'll just kind of read off. Um, number one, um, what would you recommend for mocking up a REST API? <laughs> Um, there are some really great um, libraries that you can use, like MOQ, and um, sometimes just adding in. I've seen people use splits. Um, I try, and for end-to-end -end testing, I honestly try to avoid mocking. 
um, at this level, because I want to see my actual implementation at this point, you know, when I'm doing my unit testing, that's where I might mock my um, API and rest endpoints. But in this case, I want to see, I hit the login server and I got back what I expected. I've had applications where we were testing, you know, credit card implementation. And I want to know that the services I'm using with MasterCard Gateway are working as I expect every time I implement a new feature. And they did help save things like, oh, oh, now they want us to add a zip code. Oh, okay. Like <laughs> making sure that it's catching those where if you are mocking what you expect, you might not catch that fast enough. Awesome. Um, next question. It seems like uh, the person asking this question, they, they were just curious um, where the describe method came from because they didn't see it in the imports. Hopefully that question makes sense to you. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, okay. So <laughs> the describe and it and all of those. So um, I did it. I did kind of brush over the actual setup that we do for you. And that is you can use detox with Jest and you can use it with. Um, I forgot the other testing library at the moment that you can set it up with. You can um, I think it's Mocha. Um, you can decide which one you want to use. And I have it knitted um, with to use with Jest because we're already using Jest with unit testing and it just makes more sense. Um, I'm trying to see where's my configuration, my end-to-end -end folder. So in here in my init, you can see I've got some actual uh, additional um, imports in here. Um, TypeScript isn't super happy about them. Um, my linter. And um, this is really where I'm telling it to utilize Jest. And then there's another um, adapter that's running. So it's pulling those from there. Sorry, I forgot the uh, mute there real quick. Um, <laughs> next, if you have elements that exist on iOS and not Android or vice versa, what's the best way to modify your tests for that? That is a great question and not something that I've actually had to deal with specifically um, in my testing, but I would think that you would use, um, I would think that you would use the same type of libraries of if you're running on one platform or another. So similar to how when you're running, um, you know, your actual code um, in your components and such, you can say like um, either by naming convention or you can use the, the convenience method for like if it's an iPhone or an Android to do your splits. Um, I would think you could do it the same way, but um, I, I, that actually is something I'm going to look into because I haven't thought about that specifically for end-to-end -end testing. Cool. Um, next question. Do you know about compatibilities with App Center on CI CD process? Um, I don't specifically have experience using um, this with App Center. I haven't tested that. Um, I know that we have some configurations for using deploys and things like that through Fastlane. Um, I would expect that you can use it, but I don't honestly have an answer for that. And I haven't seen it specifically called out as a capability in the detox libraries. So I've seen um, Travis, GitHub Actions, CircleCI, and BitRise um, specifically called out, but not App Center. All right. Um, next question. How well does test-driven development work with detox? Um, I mean, I, I feel like it works pretty well. It works really honestly the same as any other test-driven development method. So I can say I'm expecting these elements on the page and then go write the minimal amount of code with those identifiers. And, and then, you know, so I would have my failing test, which you saw through my presentation. You know, I, I added a test and it wasn't actually going to the login screen first. So a little bit different because those elements existed on that screen, but I wasn't navigated there yet. Um, but the same idea of I had a failing test, I went and changed a line of code to make sure it navigated where I wanted it to go, ran the test again, and I, I went through the red green you know, development uh, cycle for testing. Awesome. Um, next question, uh, would you recommend moving from Appium to detox? 
I mean, I think that's a personal preference. I personally have never written tests with Appium. Um, when I was doing a lot of research in the last couple years, when I first started using Detox, I was getting really frustrated, honestly, when I first started using Detox. I couldn't get it to work at all. Um, the configuration documentation was not the greatest at that time. And it was like trying to figure out how to make everything flow together and all the configurations correctly. Um, but from what I had read about Appium, I really decided it wasn't something that I wanted to invest in. Um, so as a personal preference, I wouldn't start with Appium. But if it's working for you, I'm not sure if you're going to get the same value out of trying to make a big shift away from it. Maybe try spiking, um, you know, utilizing detox in another application before you try and invest in rewriting tests. OK, great. Um, next question, a little longer. So I'm going to try to hopefully touch on all the main points. Okay. Um, based in, um, in your experience, did you implement CAVI on Circle CI? And uh, if so, did you see improvement using the CI platform? So I, I, I didn't. I, sorry, did didn't, that all make sense? I tried to kind yeah, of like paraphrase did. that. Okay. It did. Um, so I tested out um, utilizing CAVI locally, but I did not actually test trying to add it to my um, CI configuration. It is on my list of uh, my long to-do list of things I want to spike out just to see. But unfortunately, for a lot of the applications where I'm actually doing the end-to-end -end testing, like right off the bat, I need notification permissions or I need location permissions, which prevent me from using CAVI. Um, so I would like to understand how simple the CAVI test can run in CI on, say, just even our template. Um, just haven't touched that quite yet. It seems really simple to use, though. Great. Um, I'm looking at this. I think we have a couple more questions if you're game. Okay. Um, next question. With Detox, have you found a way to locate elements within a web view? Ooh, within a web view. I have not specifically even tried to do that. I try and avoid web views. Web views, they're um, not the best um, UI implementation from my experience. Um, so I haven't, I haven't actually tried to do that. I could see where you could locate the web view item itself, but I'm not sure that it would have the ability to find the specific item um, unless it's like by text. So yeah, I'm not sure on that. I think you would have to use the by text function, um, which would look for a specific string of text. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, a couple more questions. How much work is it to set up an existing React Native application without using your template? Um, so I don't think it's a ton of work per se. It's understanding all of the places that you have to make the changes. So uh, for example, in Android, you have to set up so it can do a test build. You have to add a specific detox Java file. Um, adding it to iOS is pretty simple. It's pretty much just adding the library and, and it integrates for you. Um, Android is definitely the trickier one where it's you have to set some very specific build configurations in the native code and add Java files, which is what led me to adding it to our template by default, because I didn't want to have to do that on every project. I wanted to make it as easy and quick as possible. So that template is something that we use to quickly get Greenfield projects up and running. OK, great. Um, does TypeScript help with testing, or does it get in the way? Um, I don't know that it necessarily helps, but I would definitely say it doesn't hurt me at all. Um, I've been using TypeScript since TypeScript was pretty new um, for many years now, and it's something that I really enjoy. Um, I think that especially if you're going to move to TypeScript, if you haven't been using it in the past, um, you know, set your, your configuration rules to not be super strict. And over time, as you move to TypeScript, just, you know, start to lock down your rules further and further. Um, 
you know, there is a time and place for, you know, utilizing any um, and not being so dogmatic about TypeScript that it makes it difficult for you. I think use the tools, you know, for the right reasons. Awesome. Okay. Let's call this one the last question. All right. um, can we integrate Redux or any state management container with detox testing? Yeah, because that's actually integrated into your application specifically. So the first time I actually used um, detox testing in an application uh, a couple years ago, our um, our app was running with Redux. So it just it, it's clicking through your application as if it were a real user. And so whatever um, Redux implementation you have in place, as if it was a real user clicking on things, you should expect the same behavior. Wow. Okay. Oh, did you have something else? I was just going to uh, say thank you for everyone's time and um, make sure if you have any questions that I didn't touch on or you want to follow up, you can you know find me on Twitter. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, just to kind of, uh, you know, Related to that, I just wanted to thank everyone for participating and remind everyone, like I said at the beginning, um, that if you're joining us on Zoom, we will email you a link to the recording of today's presentation, um, probably today or tomorrow. We try to get those out pretty quickly. Um, if you're watching this on another platform, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, then right when it's done, you can rewatch it or share it uh, just from that native platform. Um, one other thing I wanted to call out, I, I dropped a, a link in the chat uh, to the URL pluralsite.watch. And that is a URL you can go to if you want email reminders about uh, upcoming webinars. We have a lot of great stuff coming up already planned. So uh, go to pluralsite.watch if you want to fill in your email there. Um, and I think with that, Jen, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to maybe share one final takeaway with everyone here. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that I want I would like to share as parting words is just remember that you know software development and engineering is a continual learning process. You know you're gonna hit bumps along your journey. It can be a roller coaster with like really high highs and some really low lows, and just continue to push forward. It can be super rewarding. That's great. I love that. Well, thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much, Jen, for, for taking the time to be with us today. And everyone have a great rest of their day.